Hey, what's up, Flatirons Online? We are so glad that you're here. And one of the coolest things about our online community is that we have people watching from all over the place, all over the country, really all over the world. And so drop us a comment and let us know where you're watching from. And then throughout the message, if something is impactful to you, we would love to know what that is. Drop that in the comments too. You might not know that we have five different campuses in the Denver area. And we would love to get you connected. And so if you live by one of our campuses, just let us know in the comments and we would love to reach out and get you plugged in. Today, we're gonna to be talking all about the image of God, what it is, and then how it applies in our everyday lives. If you love flat irons, or if something from today's service was impactful, why don't you go ahead and hit the share button, hit the like button, and make sure that you subscribe. Hey, welcome to Flatirons. Uh, all our campuses are, are joined together right now, and then we have just thousands of people across the country that call Flatirons home. And I, I, it's just so good uh, to be with you today. It has been a, a rough, a rough uh, couple of weeks, but uh, you know, it, it really is true. It's like if you pick a fight with the devil, he, he fights back. If you try to move off zero, he just says, stay in your lane, right? And anybody feeling that? Anybody? Me and this lady, that's it, okay. Uh, so anyway, hey, uh, hey, go ahead and uh, if you have a Bible with you, and if you don't, in all of our campuses, there's Bibles in the back and you can take those home with you. Uh, find Genesis chapter one. You can do it, okay? It's on page one, okay? So, so as you're looking for that, and you're gonna want something to write with because uh, we're really gonna nerd out today and you're gonna take notes or like in the, in the uh, corners of your Bible. I prayed about it. God is fine with you writing in his book. He's, he's good. He gives you his blessing. But you know, as, uh, over the last several weeks, um, actually a couple months, we have been working our way, and we're gonna continue to do that, working our way through the first few like pages of the Bible, discovering some truths and characters that we have tended to miss, even though like our last series says, they, they're actually hidden in plain sight. It's been there all, all along. We just skip over them. That, and that's what I mean by there are passages and there are characters in the Bible that we don't really understand. And so typically we just go, I don't know. We skip over it. Or sometimes worse yet, we just make up something. It must mean, mean this. And, and, and then uh, we miss something in the story or worse yet, we get it wrong. And then it affects our whole belief system. See, we've seen all along that while, while God alone, alone is in charge, he's sovereign, right? And God alone is the creator, right? God has also shared his reign, and this is new for some of us, in the spiritual realm with what the Bible calls his divine counsel, the sons of God. They're, they're, they're lesser spiritual beings who make appearances all through the Bible. And we're gonna hit some of those over the next several months. We also find that wherever God is, his counsel is with him. And again, we're gonna be in the Garden of Eden and they're right there, right? Because Eden is where God meets with and lives with his family, both his spiritual family and his earthly family. And the plan all along was we all live together. Now we've also discovered that some of these lesser spiritual beings decide to rebel against God and against us, his image bearers, right? But that is not our topic today. That's a whole other series in about a month, okay? And then I'm gonna blow your minds. But anyway, hopefully the main takeaway from this has been no matter how, how bad or how overwhelming or it just feels like the world is getting worse circumstance that you find yourself in, here's the takeaway, Jesus wins. Jesus, the one and only unique son of God, he reigns, he is king, has, has always been about and will always be about seeking and saving, rescuing and leading, loving and giving grace and help to anybody who is lost and broken, hurting, afraid, lonely and discouraged. Please, please, this may be why God brought you here today. No one has done anything that Jesus won't forgive. No one has, done, has gone too far that Jesus would go, and I can't even help you, right? Jesus has not given up on any of us. This is the takeaway last week. Jesus loves you. Jesus will search for you. Jesus will fight for you. Jesus will lead you and guide you through your desert. Jesus will save you. You just gotta trust him. So today, though, we're gonna begin a new series where we're introduced to like the next group of players in this redemptive story called the Bible, and that would be us, how did we get here? And what would it mean to be created in the image of God? So we're gonna be in Genesis chapter one. We're gonna pick up in verse 26 and we're just gonna park here all, all day long, pretty, pretty much. Okay, so then God said, let us, and that's the, we talked about that a couple weeks ago, so we're not gonna hit it again, right? Let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them, mankind, have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens, over the livestock, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them, and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion 
dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Okay, so if you're gonna take notes, all right, there's some underliners, right? Right away, this image of God is connected to, I want you to do something, right? A functional, all right? The image of God is, is functional. That's the takeaway today, all right? Look again, verse 26. Let us make mankind in our image and then do something and let them have dominion. Verse 27. So God created man in his own image. Verse 28. And God said to them, do something. Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion, all right? So today, we're gonna answer three questions, okay? Here are the three questions. What, is, what the image of God is, what the image of God isn't, and what is our function or role as imagers of, of God? Again, you want to take notes on this. This is good. I know it's good because I ripped it all off of a really smart guy. All right, so, um, so here's what we can pick out if you just read through that a few times, just on a surface reading of that. Characteristics of the image of God. The first one is this. They are equally possessed by both men and women. There's not a masculine image and a feminine image, right? All right, now men and women have different roles, absolutely, all right, but not in imaging. We equally image God. The other thing is this, the characteristic of the image of God, it distinguishes humanity from all other creatures or creation. Nothing else in all of creation in the universe has this claim to be, well, I'm in the image of God too. No, you're not. Third thing is this, it's neither incremental or partial, it's fully there at all times, all right? You don't not have it and then grow into it, nor do you lose it at any point. If you're human, it applies, right? If we read the other chapters after this, we find out that the image of God is passed on generationally, Genesis 5. So it's not just Adam and Eve were created in the image of God. I say it like this, imagers of God give birth to imagers of God, right? And the other thing is this, it's not lost in the fall. And in Genesis 9, after the flood, God restates the image claim. These, you're made in my image. So, so rebelling against God and pursuing a sinful life does not negate that a person is still an image bearer of God. They might live in the most jacked up life ever. They're still an image bearer of God. So as I was studying for today, getting ready for this, all right, one of the authors, one of my teachers, all right, um, he, he used to teach in a Christian college, all right? And every year he had a day that just kind of blew his students away. He just said, today is abortion day. Now, time out. This is not a sermon about abortion, all right? It just illustrates that what many Christians would call themselves pro-life, they can't really articulate why very well. And when they try to, their rationale is pretty easy to pick apart, which is why most Christians' response is, I just am, all right? Which just falls apart. Okay. Anyway, this, this professor, I'm going to give you a better stance today, though, okay? The, the, the professor would start the class with, well, who here is, is pro-life? And because it was a pretty conservative school, pretty much all the hands went, went up. And he said, well, why? And the typical Christian answers came back, because life is sacred. You go, well, okay, why? Well, because we are created in, in the image of God. Well, what is it about that that makes, that makes it sacred, all right? And then here came the, the, the Christian answers, and they fall apart. I'm gonna show you why, all right? Well, because we're in the image of God, we have consciousness, all right? We're self-aware. We're aware of what's going on. Or we have sentience, all right? We have the ability to experience feelings and sensations. Okay, I agree, all right? But what about babies in the early stages of gestation? And here's the answer that comes. Well, if you just leave them alone, give them enough time, they'll become conscious and ambient. So they're potential imagers of God. And you just built a biblical case for abortion, Right? Or how about this? Well, as human beings, we have the possession of in intelligence. We can be rational and logic logical and, and have abstract thinking. We, we, we have emotions. We have a conscience. We have a sense of morality, a, an awareness, a higher power. We have the ability to communicate with God and with one another. And all of those answers fall apart at one point. Why? Well, go back to the characteristics of the image of God where we started. Why, why do they fail? Because they're not present equally among us. And they're not present actually in all of us. And some of those characteristics that we just leave there, um, they're not unique to people. What do you mean they're not present equally in all persons? If image of God is present due to brain function, this is just obvious. Some people, write this down, are smarter than other people. It's like, don't point at anybody, right, right? Um, some people are uh, more creative than other people. And we know this, some people are much more self-aware than other people, right? Or how about this? What about dementia or Alzheimer's? That my, my mom 
lost many of those abilities in her final days before she passed away. Did she stop being an imager of God? Did she become less of an imager of God? The answer is no. Or if somebody, you know, uh, sustains a brain injury or they have a genetic you know, condition affecting their ability to, to reason or communicate or feel emotions, are they less human? Are they less imagers of God? And the answer is no. Well, what about they're not present actually in all people? Well, again, related to what we talked about earlier. If the image of God is, do, is linked to brain function, well, what about an embryo? What about a zygote? Right? Any, any conceived child prior to brain function, are they not really imagers? Are they potential humans? No, so it can't be, it can't be brain function. So what about uh, all, all those criteria that we throw out, conscious, uh, uh, sentience, intelligence, emotions, moral code, higher awareness, the ability to communicate, none of those are unique to humans. What do you mean not unique to humans? Animals have some of those things. Listen, we're in Boulder County. I'm not gonna get a big argument here. You're like, I know, they're people too. They're not people too, all right? But, but you would have a hard time building and holding the argument that animals can't think or remember or feel or, or, or problem solve. You haven't met my three dogs. They're manipulative little things. I mean, they are, they, they have a plan, you know? They, they, there's, they're, they're, they're thinking about, or how about this? This is kind of making the headlines right now. Artificial intelligence. That's scary stuff. Who's saying it's scary? The creators of it are saying this is scary. Why? It has an ability to think on its own. Oh, okay, so let's just throw all those away. What about this is a big Christian answer. Well, we have a soul. You're right, we do. In Genesis chapter two, verse seven, we read that man became a living soul, a creature, right? But in Genesis 1, animals are described with the same Hebrew word for soul. Well, humans are spiritual beings. I agree, I agree. In Job 10 and Psalm 31, humans are described as having a spirit. The Hebrew word is ruah, but in Ecclesiastes 3 and Genesis 7, animals are also possessed, possess the same ruah. And here's what you go, yeah, but that's different. Okay, I'm just going with this. All right, I'm just sticking with the text. So if you build your case on the image of God is built on a list of attributes or abilities, eventually your case will fall apart. So I wanna kind of throw something else out to you today. Well, what about this? Go back to Genesis chapter one, verse 27. So God created man in his own image. We're just gonna grammatically nerd out for a little while, okay? All you English teachers, you're just gonna go like, this is the best church ever, all right? So, um, uh, so but the, the meaning of the preposition in, in Hebrew, uh, in Hebrew it's beth, all right? And it conveys a function or a status, okay? Here, let me put it like this, all right? In or Beth can be translated is or to be or as. All, all you English teachers going, he's getting an A so far, right? So, so we would be true to this text to, to translate this creation event this way. Let, let us create man to be our image or let us create man, mankind as our image. Are you following me? Oh, let's get a little bit more nerdy, okay? It's just like, you're going, he's, he really is a nerd. I know, all right? The word in can be interpreted several different ways depending upon context. For example, and again, I'm just totally ripping off a professor, so don't think I'm this smart, okay? But if I use the word in in this way, maybe in this way, there we go. I put the dishes in the dishwasher, I'm conveying location. That's where they went. If I use the word in in this way, I broke the dish in pieces, I'm conveying result. Follow me? If I use it this way, I wrote a letter in pencil, I'm talking about causality, right? Now what's this one? If I use the word in, th in this way, I work in medicine, or I work in education, I work in accounting, I'm talking about function. What I'm saying is I work as a doctor, I work as a nurse, a teacher, I work as an accountant, I work in medicine, I function as a doctor. I work in education. I function as a teacher. In other words, it is a statement that is functional, not qualitative, because as we just worked through, all those qualitatives, they fall apart. So we can read what God created when he created us as this, let us create man as or to be our image. So God created man as or to be his image. And so here the takeaway of all this is the image of God is a status or a role, not a quality. You following me? It's a stat, it's what, it's what I am. In other words, um, we are created to be God's proxy, his representative, wherever we go. I'll say it one more time. To be human is to be an imager of God. Not dependent upon a quality or an attribute or even your lifestyle. 
See, the, 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 this view is consistent with the biblical characteristics of God. It's equally present in respect to all humans. It's actually present with respect to all humans and it is unique, unique to, to people. Now, now, earlier I stated that the image of God is not undone by the fall or the presence of sin in an imager's life, but in a fallen world, only a, a, a person who's, who's been redeemed and forgiven has Christ living in them can do it, can, re, can image him in the full way that God intended it to happen. And this is just logical. A person cannot be in an adversarial relationship with God and then represent him well in this life. Makes sense, right? And what, what does all that mean, right? It means this. God created us in his image and the next words out of his mouth were, now I want you to do something. He gave us a job, a job description. What, you, what? Okay, I created you in my image. Now be fruitful and multiply and have dominion over the whole earth. And well, what does that mean to have dominion? Because it doesn't mean to go dominate everything, all right? It means God is saying, as my image bearer, I want you to partner with me to take my goodness, my, my image, my way, my truth, my life that I offer. I want you to take that out of Eden where you are to the whole world. So the whole world and all of creation experience Eden. Take Eden to the whole world where God and his family live together. That's, I want you to take that to the world. This is what it looks like for God and people to live together. Be fruitful and multiply. Go back to what Dr. Crawford Loritz taught us earlier this summer. Parents lean into this. The essence of parenting is to paint a picture of the destination. That's gold. That's what parenting is about. In other words, parents, as imagers of God, your job is to teach your children, not about football and baseball and math and careers. and That's all important. Your job is to teach your children about the God that they image so that when they grow up and leave your house, wherever they land on the planet, they will image God as he truly is and they'll take his word, his way, and it will have dominion wherever they, they, they take him. Got it? You may do a lot of things right as a parent. If you miss this one, you've missed it. Well, what's the payoff if we're out there imaging God? Well, think about it. Think about it. By the way, this is a 25-minute sermon. We're gonna get out of here. We're gonna beat the Baptist to brunch. It's gonna be a good day, all right? So, all right. <laughs> Think about it. <laughs> Baptists don't eat brunch. Anyway, um, <laughs> think about if, let's just talk about this, this church, all right? What, what, if, what if we took Eden to the whole world? And this is where we're gonna go over the next few weeks. What would that, I just wanna imagine for a few minutes, right? What if every one of us, what if, what if we understood the sanctity of life? Because when we looked out at one another, the first thing that we saw in another person wasn't their race or their social status or their politics or their gender or their success or their failure or their pre-born or post-born, whether their genius IQ or in the final stages of Alzheimer's and can't even take care of themselves. We didn't see if they were gay or straight. That's not the first thing we saw. We saw, I'm looking at an imager of God and that alone, that's enough. That's what makes them sacred. And now I will treat them with all the honor and dignity that I believe that that sacredness is true and present. Even if I 100% disagree with their beliefs and actions, they're sacred because they're an imager of God. And that is enough. Think about it. Think about. And now here's what, it's, it's, it's kind, of, kind of on a clap, but what, here's what's going on. But what about? They're an imager of God. There is no other category. Think, think about what imaging God would mean to our marriages. This Thursday, we're gonna, we're gonna look at some of that to, to, to our parenting. If we saw parents, if we saw our roles as parents is to equip these, these little imagers, they might be demonic some days, but they are still imagers of God, all right? Uh, that, that you produced or you adopted or you're fostering. If, if your whole life was about, I'm preparing them to leave my home and image Jesus everywhere they go and they learned it from watching Mom and dad image God at your house. We're going there next week, okay? Think about your job. Think about the sanctity of work. What if we viewed the creation of wealth, going out there and making money from the standpoint that it, it, it must, I have to use something, it must benefit my fellow imagers. It's not all about me or for me. That's not socialism. That's generosity driven by the same love that Jesus has given you. Generosity is, a, is an outpouring of Christ in me. What if you saw yourself as, as the image of God, which is sacred, and everybody that you interact with at work or at school or the playground or on, 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 your, on your team or on your, on your fantasy football, whatever that is, you saw all those people, men and women as sacred also. Think about, think about how much more you could get done. 
You could get so creative if we weren't fighting about all that stuff. We, we could do more R&D together. We could develop new art. New, we could work together instead of constant competition and separation, you know, like it was in Eden. And, and like it's gonna be in the, the, the new one. What if because you're a sacred space, you no longer had categories called secular and sacred? Instead, every, that's what Paul said, let everything you do be done to the glory of, the proper image of, imaging of, this is what God is like. I don't know what your career is, whether you're a cop, whether you're a lawyer, maybe not a lawyer. Uh, uh, I'm kidding, lawyers. I'm just kidding, all right? Uh, it doesn't matter why. You're, you're a school teacher. You're a coach. You're a stay-at-home parent. You're a bartender. You're a landscaper. You're waiting tables to get yourself through college. Or you're, you're, you're playing pickleball in your retirement. I don't know. You bring God's image into every environment anytime you show up there. So unless you're a professional sinner, your job is sacred, that's what Jesus meant when he said, let your light shine before people that they may see your good deeds, the way that you live your life and give praise to the God that you're representing. And listen, I, I know it's like some, some of us going, I don't, I don't want that to be true. <laughs> listen, I know we all, we, we're all, we're very, this is a very diverse crowd, right? We have all kinds of different opinions, political, I've heard from you, all right? Uh, viewpoints and passion points. We, we, we all come from different backgrounds and experiences, there are people in this world that are right, and there are some people in this world who are just dead wrong. There are some good people in this world, and there are some horrible people in this world. There are people who would die for you, and there's people who would probably like to see you dead, right? But the one thing that levels the playing field is this. We, I, he, she, right, is an image bearer of God. And every person you meet is a sacred image bearer who is loved by God and Jesus is willing to die for them to have them back in his family. And, and the main role, not one of the roles, the main role of your life could be summed up in just a few questions, but really I'll sum it up in the last one. Does what you do, what you say at work, at home, at school, anywhere else, does it value people as fellow imagers? The people you interact with every day, your, 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 your person you're married to or the person you're dating do, your, do you value your kids as imagers? Do you value your parents with the dignity that, are, that an imager, like your teachers at school, the employees that, that, that are dependent upon you? Or do you use them? How, how about this? Does it promote the welfare of fellow imagers? As you, as you live your life, as you go to work, as you go to school, are you just looking out for yourself? Or are you actually considering, hey, we're all kind of in this together, how about this? Does it assist or impede fellow imagers to the destiny God desires? God has a plan for their life. Do you care about that? And, and ultimately, does it, in, does it imitate the ultimate imager, Jesus? So I just want to sum up this whole sermon with one question. And what I do and say at work, at school, or anywhere else, here's the question. Am I giving Jesus a good reputation based on how I live my life? Will people at work or school look back at you one day and go, you know, I knew this guy, I knew this girl, all right? Um, and they, they were Christian. And you know, he was pretty cool. You know, like everybody else. Or that, that girl in, in my class, she, she, she treated me better than everybody else made fun of me or, or left me out. But she, she's like, they had something, like someone like inside of them. And I, I'll be honest with you, I wish I had that. I'm going to talk to parents. Will your kids look back at you and say, my parents followed Christ, imaged Christ in such a way, I want what they have when I'm out on my own. Or will they graduate high school and not even look back and just say, no thanks. If that's what it looks like. That's convicting, right? Uh, so let me switch. Back in the Old Testament, one of the big like don'ts from God was, uh, that's the second commandment of the 10 commandments. Don't take a rock or a piece of wood and carve it into an image and then worship it. All right. And we look back at that and go, well, of course. All right. Now let me give you a little background on idols that I think that we miss. All right. Back then when the Bible was being written, um, in, in order for a, to worship a spiritual being that didn't have a form or a location, what they would do is they'd take rocks or sticks and they would carve statues. Right. And then I, this is new to me. Then they would, um, they'd have a special ceremony where they 
they open the nostrils of the statue and breathe life into it. And at that point, the disembodied spirit would now have a located place where people could come to and speak to it and worship it and, and offer sacrifices to it. Pray, pray to it. Now that language should sound familiar because if you read Genesis 1 and 2, when, when, that's what God did with us. He took dust and he formed us. And then he breathed his life into us. And that's when we became a living creature, soul. So we became human. Now, if something bad happened to that statue or that idol or that image, all right? Like say an enemy came into town and destroyed everything and, and tore down the idol. The people didn't think their God was dead. They just thought, we got to build him a new house, right? But when Yahweh, Jehovah, God, right? When he gathered his people out of Egypt, right before they went into the promised land, he said, listen, you, don't do that. Because you don't have to create an image to represent me because I've already done it. It's you. You're my image, right? And I live in you so that you can be me wherever you go and in whatever you do. In other words, don't trade in or dumb down a God who's everywhere and present in all of us to one location or one building or one statue where you have to go somewhere and meet with him. No, if you're there, he's there. So what would that look like? Right? This is really, very, how is it possible to live a life that images God as he really is? Where would we look to find an example of a person who, who's doing that? And of course, the answer is Jesus, right? This is what Paul writes uh, about, about this. He says, for God who said, Genesis chapter one, verse one, for God who said, let light shine out of darkness, that same God has shown in our hearts, why? To give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God. What is, where do you find the glory of God? In the face of Jesus Christ. So what Paul is saying is, if you wanna see, if you wanna know what the glory, the image, the reflection of what God would look like if he was to like, be lived out in flesh and blood, you can find that in the face, in the life of Jesus Christ. Just, just look at him. He lived a life that perfectly imaged God. Jesus walked around this, this earth and, and basically his whole statement was, this is what it looks like. This is what it looks like to live with God and to image God. Right? Uh, Paul writes this in Romans chapter eight. If you, if you want a chapter of the Bible to read this week, Romans chapter eight, it's a, it's a, it's a greatest hits right here, okay? And we know that for those who love God, that would be us, all things work together for good. Time out. How many things work together for good? Uh, and I did a study on it. It means all. But don't read too much into it. It doesn't say all things are good. It just says all things, right? All right, let me start over, okay? We know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose, and that would be us. For those whom God foreknew, he also predestined, key word there is destiny. So whatever's about to come is our destiny. He predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he, Jesus, might be the firstborn among many brothers. So let, let me, alarm's going off, so let me land, land with this, all right? There's a lot of junk that's gonna happen to you in your life. All things. Many things are gonna happen. Uh, good things are gonna happen, I hope, all right? Bad things are gonna happen, probably ever have. Things that are your fault and things that just landed on you, you didn't get a vote. And God is promising, I won't waste any of it, even the bad stuff. I will, because I'm God, I, I can do this. I can work it for something good that you probably won't be able to see in the moment while it's happening. But God knows you and he has the destiny for you to use everything to conform you to the image of his son. Um, have you ever gone, this is gonna sound like ADD, all right, um, have you ever, uh, like, I gotta get a key duplicated, right? And so you go to Ace or you go to Home Depot or something like that. I don't know if they still do this because it's all lasers and stuff now, but here, when, I, when I have to do this, all right, I'll take the key, my house key or whatever, and I'll take it and they put it in a machine and on this, on this side they put a blank key, right? It's just flat, right? And on this side is my key and then there's a pointer that goes up and down all the ridges of my key and over here on this side is a grinding wheel, Right? And as it goes down into the groove here, it cuts into that and then it comes up. And by the end of it, I have an, the same image. I think life is like that. Um, sometimes I think, what if that, that key that's getting carved into 
had a voice. What would that little key say? It'd be very similar to my prayer life. Stop. I don't like this. This hurts. I don't understand. Why is this happening? Anybody prayed that prayer? And Jesus said, or, or, he, he says, because when we're done, you'll be like me. So here's the grinding wheel of your life. Your divorce. Your cancer. The funeral you had to go through. The abuse that happened. None of it was good. You got abandoned. You got addicted. You got betrayed. And it cuts something into you and you'll never be the same. I really do think this, unless that little key has the power of Christ, it'll break him. But with Christ on the other side, look, look at this. Right? And you go like, that just feels hard. This, this, is, this is why he does it. See what great love the Father has lavished on us? And I love that word lavished. Um, and here's what it reminds me of. Um, when my six grandkids come over to the house, they're like, hey, pop, pop. And they're trying to be cool because they're 11, you know? And, I, and you know what I do? I push it, I just, come here. I'm like, Argh. and they're like, pop, pop. You're right, right. I lavish. I don't like, good to see you, grandson. I, it's not, no, no. I mean, we're rolling, is all right? That's lavish. What, what great love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called, this is crazy, children of God. And that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it didn't know him. Dear friends, now we are children of God and what we will be, so, so this is not the finished product, thank God, right? What we will be has not yet been made known. Here's a hint though. But we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him, finally. For we shall see him as he is. All who have this hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure. And then we're purified themselves. This is what we're doing right now, all right? We are, we're running, spirit, we're, we're trying to be spiritually formed in our inner character so that our outward lives image God as he is. All right, I, I really, I'm almost done. Listen, do you, does anybody, are you old enough to remember the WWJD bracelets? Anybody? Yeah, who had them? Who had them? Okay, yeah, some of you, I got one on right now. You're old. Okay, so, all right. <laughs> And they said, for what would Jesus do? I, I had a, a bunch of them, right, right? And the question is, if you find yourself in a tough situation, just ask yourself, well, what would Jesus do? And then to do that, which sounds great, but again, it falls apart at a certain point because um, I, I, don't, I don't know how to walk on water. I don't know how to heal the sick. I, don't, I can't cure cancer. I can't raise the dead and I cannot calm a stormy sea. If I could do that, that's what I would do every time, especially walk on water. Right? All right. But I think that the image of God causes us to ask this question. But what, I don't know if I can do it. He was, but what if I was the same kind of person he is? What if I had the same kind of character that Jesus has? What if I lived my life with the same kind of honor if I saw other people the way that Jesus saw them? And then I'll, I'll change the question a little bit, okay? Uh, again, I, I'm not Jesus, but what if Jesus had this body, yours? What if Jesus had your opportunities? What if Jesus grew up in the house you grew up in? What if Jesus had the same health stuff going on that you have going on? What if Jesus had the same financial situation that you're in? What if Jesus was 13? What if he was your age? What if he went to your school or, or worked in the cubicle next to you or whatever, right? It, what, if, if Jesus, how about this? If Jesus had some of the same things happen to him when he was a kid that you've had happen to him, to, to you, Right? Good or bad, fair or unfair. I'm just saying, that given the reality of your life, and, I, and I'm trying to have the character of Christ, my question is now, how am I gonna respond? What am I gonna do? Knowing that my life, my words, my actions, what I choose to do or not, not to do, whom I decide I'm gonna extend love and dignity to and who I'm gonna withhold it from, all of those image Jesus for better or worse. Bottom line, am I giving Jesus a good reputation as I bring him into every room I go into, every conversation, every situation that I find myself in. I heard somebody say this way. I am, I may be the only image of Jesus that some people will see today. Am I, am I, am I doing that well? Now, we're gonna, there's no more music, okay? We did it all at the beginning. Um, I wanna try something. This past Wednesday night, um, 
I had, I had 2,000 men in here for our integrity conference. It was awesome, and hundreds more online across the world. It was great. But uh, we would have a session, and then we'd have a break. And I, and I, and I, tried, to, I tried this last night, and uh, I, it worked last night, and hopefully it'll work right now. Uh, here's what I said. Hey, hey I'm going to pray, and then before you get up and run to get your kids or run to the parking lot or run to the restaurant or blah, 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 blah right? here's what I'm going to ask you to do. I wanna, I'm going to ask you to turn to the person next to you even if it's a stranger, you're not confessing sin or anything, don't worry, all right, all right? Um, And here's what I want, to tell you, I want you to say to it. Before you get up, the one thing that stuck with me today is, the one thing I wanna think about is, um, I think I need to look at this in my own life. And you don't have to tell them what it is, just going, I know what mine is. I need, I, I need to think about this more or I know what needs to change in my life. See, I, I don't flatter myself. I don't think that you walk out of these rooms and remember every word of my sermon. I don't even do that, okay? Um, but there's one thing. There's just one thing maybe that's gonna anchor itself going, that's what God wanted me to pay attention to today. What, what is that? And if that feels too weird going, I don't, I don't talk to people. That's just not my gift, all right? right? Um, then, then wait till you get to the car. But just, just don't do what I always do. Just don't file this away and go, I'll think about this. Because you won't. Because you know what? Right outside the doors of this auditorium, right outside the parking lot, it's going to get nuts. It's going to get crazy and everybody's going to want a piece of you this and you got to do this and you're late for this and all that. So I'm just saying, before you walk out of here, say it out loud. Hey, this is one thing I, want, I think God wants me to think about. And then go get your kids. See, you're out of here on, almost on time. All right? Um, um, so I'm going to pray. And then I'm going to say Amen. And if you need to leave, leave, okay? But if you just, just take that time, right? And just say, the thing that stuck with me is this, all right? So God, we sit here right now, uh, uh, we are your imagers, and, uh, and, and even better, we have you inside of us. We're not a statue. We're temples. We are we're created to be as you, like you, to represent you. And, and God, sometimes we get it right. It's like we start, sometimes we just feel your presence and you're right here with us. And then sometimes it just gets really, really lonely. And, and then we look back going, I, I did not, I did not mean to say that. I did not mean to do that. And, and you'll forgive everything, absolutely. Um, but God, we, we came into this place because we want to follow you a little bit closer, a little bit better. We want our lives to change, uh, to be more like you. And so, God, what's that one thing? That you, came, that you brought us into these places to teach us about how our life and Jesus together, this is what it looks like. We pray all of this in the wonderful name of Jesus. Amen. Take a minute or two, and then you're dismissed. Thanks for tuning in to Flatirons Church Online. Hope you enjoyed it today and that God moved in a mighty way. We want to let you know that we have brand new content coming out all the time, including live streams every single Sunday. And if you don't want to miss out on any of that content, make sure that you hit the subscribe button. We also wanna let you know that if you believe in what Flatirons is doing and that's to reach a lost and broken world, there's a give button that you can hit to take next steps there. Well, we hope you enjoyed it and we can't wait to see you next time.